Hello and thank you for joining us. You're listening to a We Do Talk with David Jakes. Helping people and helping people to help other people is a big part of the mission here at We Do. So it's always great when I can get a guest on here that has a similar type of mission and the same type of vision. And today's guest certainly shares that, uh, somebody who helps a lot of people in his professional life and personal life as well, I think. And it's my pleasure to introduce Robbie Kale, who is joining us today from Montana. So a very good morning to you, Robbie. Welcome to We Do, and thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And whereabouts in Montana are you located, by the way? In the northwest corner near the border with Canada, it's called Kalispell. It's, uh, it's called the, the area is called the Flathead Valley. It's uh, right next to the Glacier National Park. It, it looks like the end of land before time. It's a, kind of a, a movie. It's a, it's a green valley surrounded by mountains. It's very beautiful. Wow. You're in a great part of the country. I know the, the, that part of Montana is beautiful. I know that eastern Montana is probably pretty flat. So you're, I'm sure you're in the best part of the state. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's nuts, actually. It's, like, it's almost like two totally different worlds. Uh, it's divided by the Rockies. And on the right side of it, yeah, open plains with hurricane level winds, uh, even when there's not a storm. And then on our side, it's very lush and a lot more trees. Beautiful. So a great place to practice the type of work that you do. And uh, Robbie, you are uh, qualified in some very traditional disciplines such as therapy and social work, but you're also mm -hmm. uh, practitioner, a qualified practitioner in several other things such as neuro-linguistic programming, hypnotherapy, Reiki, timeline therapy, and life coaching. So would love to talk to you about all of those and some of the work that you've done. But I guess my first question would be, at what point in your life did you realize that your focus was going to be on helping other people? I, I had a kind of unique upbringing. I was actually raised by a bunch of yogis, uh, people that met as yogis before I was born, at least. And so, you know, for me, meditation specifically is kind of a very uh, laser focused form of prayer, I guess you could say, where you're opening up and gu guiding energy is in, through focused breath and visualization. Um, and, and that's really basically an act of service for the world. And so, you know, I've been doing that since I was, you know, four or five years old, and I've been doing that ever since. And uh, yeah, so I, I kind of always knew I wanted to show up and be of service to others. Um, even before I went into social work, I, um, you know, I have a long history of mental health and social work jobs. Uh, but then in my 20s, I noticed during my meditations, my hands got really activated. And so I started working on uh, some people in my life that were struggling intuitively and progressed from there to doing a lot of other modalities too. And, and where did it all start? Did you uh, go to college and qualify in social work counseling and that type of thing first? In my mid twenties, I, I didn't I didn't go get my master's until my late twenties. Um, yeah, I, I, ironically, I went back to get my master's. I think partly so that when I did energy work, people would know or have faith that I wasn't a, a back alley quack because it's a little unorthodox. And at least in this area of the country, people are less familiar with things like quantum touch or Reiki, what have you. Um, so yeah, it it, it sort of. Um, started with i'd say the energy work and then kind of went from there and when you work with people are your clients um, in person do you have people coming to an office or to your home to work or do you do most of it online like we're doing here i, I guess if someone wants to see me remotely i can i have an office here but i, I have an in-person office I think here in Kalispell. and then yes I, I do teletherapy as well so but no one no one's physically at my you know apartment Right, right. But I would imagine that with some of the, the energy work that you do, um, that is something that uh, the internet communications and maybe even the pandemic of the last couple of years might have helped because people definitely are looking for more online connections and way of being able to do things. Is, is that true for you? Absolutely. I, just the other week, I worked with someone out of England, you know, and I'm connecting with them via video chat and my experience is that the energy work yeah, absolutely transcends space and um, yeah, it, it's it has had comparable results to people I've worked with on the other side of the world as people in the same room with me. Great. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, ask you about some of the energy work that you do in the different disciplines and with more traditional things like therapy and social work. I think most people are familiar with those. Um, but uh, neuro linguistic programming NLP, could you give our viewers, listeners, a little bit of an overview as to what that is and, and how you can use that to help people? 
When you think about what's driving the bus, you know, if you think of an end behavior or even the struggles with, you know, emotional dysregulation, anxiety, depression, what have you, if you think of an iceberg as, you know, your conscious mind is the part of the iceberg above the water line, most of the iceberg is underneath the surface. In the same way, most of what's dictating your actions and how you perceive your reality is your unconscious or your subconscious mind. And a lot of times we have beliefs that we're not even aware that we believe, or we'll have dual beliefs where we believe the thing and the opposite of it as well. And so when you're looking at theta healing and new linguistic programming, and honestly also the EMDR that I do, you're talking about what can I do to flip switches and clear limiting beliefs uh, pertaining to the iceberg underneath the surface. And, and unfortunately talk therapy you know, is, is uses the conscious mind that doesn't, if that alone, I would say does not go deep enough truly to affect change on a core level. And so I found comp complementing it with actually shifting core beliefs. Um, yeah. It has way more lasting effect than just focusing on symptom management for the week, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so more, um, trying to uncover things in the, the subconscious mind rather than just, the surface of this is what's bothering me today and this is why I'm having a rough day. Yeah, and going back to where it's all connected, you know, if we were to admit that or look at us through the lens of energy, right? You know, you have your organism, organs, muscle tissues, all the way down where we're all energy. Yeah. But if you think of mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, and social, all is energy too, right? So emotional, you know, you, there's a flow to energy. And if you think of a hose with water in it, you can have kinks in the hose where it's, it's blocked. And that can manifest in all of those areas. So mental, you're talking about holding on to I should haves or what ifs versus me being present. Yeah. Emotionally, you're talking about shaming yourself versus showing yourself grace. You know, spiritually, you're talking about feeling lost and without purpose versus direction focused. You know, physical, you're talking about any kind of physical health issues you have. Um, Social, you're talking about strained relationships and really difficulty with boundaries. You know, so basically we're talking about what are we doing to unkink the hose but it all starts with really what is our inner narrative? How do I identify with myself? What are the beliefs that I'm telling myself? And do these still serve me? Maybe they used to, but maybe they no longer do. Yeah. So the more we shift that, the more you can unk the, unkink the hoses in all those areas of your life. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great explanation. Um, so moving on to Reiki, uh, I think you know, some people have an understanding of what that is. Would you kind of give us your description of how you use that in practice? So when I do it, I vi either, vi you know, if they're remote, I visualize putting palms to their feet, or if I'm actually with them, I actually put my palms to the feet. I've noticed, you know, reflexology shows you that all your body systems connect down at the bottoms of the feet. So I've just found that that allows it to flow the most easily. So um, I'm basically being a conduit. I'm holding the ends of two wires, so to speak, uh, between, I guess, what you could call source energy and a person. So I'm using guided breath and visualization to sort of Silence the mind, get out of the way and be kind of a, like a human PVC pipe, right? Like a tunnel to course the energy into a person to help them unkink the hose and flow better. I love the way that you are using these analogies with things like PVC pipe and hosing, because the, those are things, everyday items that we can understand. And so that, that's, that's a really great way of understanding it. Thank but, you. And then um, moving on to timeline therapy, that's, I'm kind of intrigued as to what that is. Yeah, so timeline therapy, it's interesting. You know, when we're talking about those core beliefs, it can be events that happen in your timeline, but it also can be an intergenerational trauma that was passed down by physio you know, physiology, or it can be, you know, if you're open and receptive to the notion of past lives, it can be something you brought in from before you incarnated or while you were in the womb. And so what you're talking about is going safely above your timeline, floating up to the event and taking the learnings of which will allow you to easily and effortlessly release the rest of the monkeys on your back tied to it to let those pieces float downstream. So we take the learnings and release the rest. And then you position yourself before even that event and you, from that angle, where is that feeling of that trauma or that hurt? And from before it, we see that, oh, it's, it's gone now from this vantage point. And then basically it allows you to release the energy of stuff that is no longer serving you um, yeah. and still allow you the learnings to move forward. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, when I hear timeline, I, I have this very bizarre fascination with the calendar and with dates and, and I can remember landmarks on the calendar of, you know, this was five years ago, this was 10 years ago, this was eight months ago or whatever. So I, I, I have a, 
a, a strange relationship with with the calendar and the and the memory. And I'm a great believer in as time moves on, you go through periods of growth. And I don't know whether this is connected with timeline therapy or not, but I can think back in my life of you know a particular year, for example, of wow, that was just such a great growth year for me personally, professionally, physically, anything. And then you can go through a couple of years where nothing really happens and everything is just on a just kind of steady as she goes. Uh, is is that the sort of thing that you would you would use to help people identify? I think what we're really just talking about is you know what are the root issues here. So if I'm dealing with a limiting belief being curious about what is that about for me? Where does that come from? And, you know, are the, where it did come from, are there pieces of that that do not serve me, that would, that would serve me to be able to detach from and let go of and stay yeah. only with the pieces that are positive and, you know, for my growth and evolution. And, you know, cause I think that, you know, energetically, if we're talking about the somatics of it, we deal with, you know, holding on to, the energy of and spend bandwidth focusing on pieces that maybe are you know uh, taking up the, the 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 RAM hard drive. You know what I mean? That's yeah. bogging us down. When maybe you've ever you've ever taken a keys and you take all the extra loops and trinkets off of it. And you're like, wow. When I actually just have just the pieces of the keys that I actually use, this is like ten times lighter. You know, <laughs> it's it's almost like that. You know. Yeah. Um, but we're not using our conscious mind. We're using sort of like our intuitive unconscious mind or our inner knowing about those pieces versus trying to analyze and figure it out with the brain, you know? Yeah. 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 But I mean, I hear what you're saying. You're, you're right. I mean, I think that is an interesting thing how, um, you know, life can shift and you can have a, a decade's worth of growth in a week and you can have a couple of years where you just kind of coast. Yeah. Now, when, when somebody comes to you, if a new client comes to you and whatever space of life they're in where they feel they need some help, whether it's, whether it's therapy or someone that you get connected to through social work and you have all of these different tools. Uh, I look at somebody like yourself as someone with a, this toolkit and a lot of knowledge and a lot of different things. How do you decide what you use, what of these different types of, of energy therapies you use, or do you kind of combine everything? It's, that's a great question. I mean, I think part of it is setting the, the precedent that it's a co-created interaction, that it's not the Robbie show, because at the end of the day, I want you to feel like you know, you're being, your perspective is honored and that you got what you needed from me. With that said, you know, we don't know what we don't know, right? That there's some things that you would have no way of knowing to ask for because you've never heard of it before. And so there is sort of an element of intuitive guidance of what, you know, me getting out of my even head, even, even though we're talking conceptual things, I do feel this is really cheesy, but I feel like I'm, I'm like blasting them with the Care Bear stare, you know, it's like hmm. letting my heart guide that experience versus trying to think my way through it, you know? Yeah. And so I, I would say a lot of it is, checking in with them. Here's a piece that may be helpful. Delete this if this doesn't resonate, but, you know, and I think that I, allowing them to have space to give their own input along the way about what is and isn't working can help also guide me towards the pieces that uh, seem the most helpful. With that said, you know, when it comes to core beliefs, there's honestly only a handful of things that universally, you know, and with all the different manifestations of anxiety or trauma or low self-esteem, I mean, it's usually about worthiness or some piece not feeling safe. You know, there's only, and, and so if we can get down to those bottom Jenga set pieces and you clear out one bottom tile, you know, it doesn't matter what the stack looks like, the rest of the tower comes collapsing down in a place of resolution. Um, it's just about helping them understand how they think versus what they think is a big piece of it. So if we can help you feel like you're reclaiming your narrative and helping you feel you're enhancing your awareness, there's no wrong answer because it's the truth is people don't remember what you say. They remember how you make them feel. Uh, and so if you play, come from a place of genuine caring, you, you, you're not going to really miss, you know? And it's all about, of course, I, I think that's very valid what you say. It's not the Robbie show. It's all about helping somebody to understand themselves, not you telling them, but helping them to get that inner understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, so Robbie, you've obviously helped a number of people, many people, I think in the work that you do. And 
Um, of course, you have confidentiality agreements with everybody and there's certain things you can't say, sure. but could you give some kind of just general high level examples of, of people that you may have helped who've come to you with some sort of a trauma and how you've been able to help them acknowledge it, deal with it and recover? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, one of the best examples I have, I worked with a guy and he was in his mid twenties and, you know, like many other people, he was struggling with, I am not enough. I'm unworthy. And aside from my formal trainings, I actually have a really strong background in creative writing. And I spent a lot of time in the slam poetry community. And there's a lot of parallels between someone writing something that hits you in the gut and someone getting to a bottom of their beliefs and kind of clearing a bottom uh, core belief, core limiting belief. So there's these things called digging questions. Um, one of the things that you keep asking is what's the worst part about that? And you get down to the bottom belief. And for him, it was, I'm not enough. I'm unworthy. And uh, one of the questions you go with that is, all right, now that we identified that, when did you first feel that way? And he remembered um, striking out in Little League when he was nine years old. And that memory has been haunting him for, for years. And so one of the writing processes I have, have people do is, you know, using your senses and describing it without saying it. You know, we want to show versus tell in the writing world. And he wrote about the thickness in the air in the silence on the bus ride home when no one came up to console him. And by writing it out, it released the energy that's been snagged up inside of him about that experience. And of course, it also positioned him to be at the top of the mountain, pulling the next person up who may also struggle with, you know, isolation or inadequacy. And so, and then I coupled that with some uh, NLP and some theta healing uh, techniques in terms of clearing out that belief. And um, then you, you can do a thing called muscle testing to identify did I actually clear it or, or did I actually, um, am I still holding on to that belief? Um, so that, that's just one random example. But um, ultimately what we're talking about is whenever someone needs help, whether you're talking about someone coming to a therapist or a counselor or a life coach, they're on the effect side of a cause effect equation of their life. I've been through this, I went through that, and now I'm left with X, whatever that is, right? So whatever, the, all of these pieces are different ways of basically let's help get you tactically back on the cause side of the equation where maybe we can't change the past, but we can definitely change the lens in which we, we look at it. That's a great example. Thanks. And um, I hate to bring this down to something as mundane and everyday as like economics and money, but um, does insurance cover some of the services that you do or do people have to pay out of pocket? The insurances do require to be evidence-based and yes, you can do, you know, a lot of these things fall under the umbrella of what we'll call mindfulness exercises, which goes along with dialectical behavioral therapy, which is evidence-based and is reimbursed. Um, it, you know, there are certain pieces of this, I'd say timeline, Reiki, unfortunately, the, the formal Western institutions are still catching up in terms of uh, under their understandings. When I reached out to talk to the, the Board of Behavioral Health here in Montana about Reiki, they didn't even know what Reiki was. It is a little more nuanced when you're dealing with insurances. A little while ago, when you were talking about why somebody might come to you, you, you used a word which has become very profound in the last couple of years, isolation, when somebody's feeling isolated. And we've just really emerged or still are emerging from this pandemic that gripped the world for two years, more than two years. And, and isolation has become a huge problem for, for many people. Have you seen an, an uptick in people, an increase in people coming to you for help just, just simply because they feel isolated and they feel alone and they feel that they're in some kind of a despair? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, we, there's this thinking error that we do called emotional reasoning. The truth is that feelings feel very true and painful, difficult feelings feel that much more true. And like the way I explain to people, if I felt unlovable, you know, does that make me unlovable? Well, of course not. But, you know, the challenge is how do I reshape my relationship with this feeling where maybe I, I have it be a passenger that I notice in the car versus it being the driver of the, the bus. You know, there's work to be had to reshaping isolation into solitude. When I think about what alienation, what isolation is about, I think about what, your, what, what is your, your social needs. We're talking about community. And behind community, we're talking about a situation where you get to feel seen, heard, understood, and validated, right? And the truth is, the more I think about it, or the more I've been working on it in my own also, like uh, fostering a place of inner solitude, 
is the notion of inner community. I would say, all right, along with reshaping our feelings of the alienation, seeing, hearing, validating, and understanding ourselves so as to help turn the alienation into, into solitude, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I also think that there is, there's a great place for solitude and everybody's different. It, for some people, it works very well. Some people enjoy their own company. They enjoy time alone. They enjoy time to themselves. Other people need to have a lot of social interaction around them the whole time. There's no right or wrong answer. It depends who you are. But um, I, I, I'm a great believer in um, being able to take that time for yourself, being able to take that time, whether it's meditation, whether it's spirituality. For me, it's running. I go out running early in the morning. I go alone. I don't play music. I don't do anything. And I'm alone with my thoughts. And it's amazing how that's probably my most creative time of day where I can just have that alone time. I can think about things. I can solve problems. I can be more creative. And, and for me, that is a, a great place to be. And if I don't do that, I feel that a part of me is missing. Totally. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. Just as much as it is about clearing limiting past beliefs, I think kind of what you're, you're touching on is the notion of what are your daily rituals, right? What are the ways that we consistently show up you know, in terms of meeting our needs. And yeah, I, I think that a lot of times people feel like that's out of their comfort zone because it's like the unknown, but it, it's funny how it's, it's, a, it's a matter of just like doing it anyways, right? We do it for a couple of weeks and we form the habit. And then, you know, if you skip a day, it'll feel like you didn't brush your teeth that day, you know? And, and of course, society and uh, movies and media tends to, l tends to portray people who are very successful as people who run at 100 miles an hour all the time, never take a break, never sleep, never do anything, that, that's, that's not realistic. And I think that it's very easy oh. to get caught up in that of, I should do more, I should work harder, I shouldn't take vacation, I should pu pu be putting myself under a lot of pressure. But in actual fact, wouldn't you say that the more you do take that time for yourself, even if it's only a little bit of time a day, make sure that you take care of your own needs it can make you stronger, right? Yeah, so two things to that. You're absolutely right. The question is, am I doing this? Is this a leaning in toward behavior or is this me pulling away? You know, sometimes me sitting on the couch and eating Cheetos is me fulfilling my needs. But if I'm doing it as a place of avoidance because it's uncomfortable for me to go do my job or whatever the thing is I'm avoiding, yeah. you know, we, it's more about, like you said, finding opportunities to face the things we're avoiding and like you said, you know, sometimes, you know, leaning in can be recentering re and recouping and uh, hard resetting, we'll say. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But I think a piece of it also is replacing shoulds because a should is a judgment. If I say I should go to the gym more, I'm saying really I'm less than or bad if I don't go to the gym. And it may get me to the gym, but from a place of robbing myself of my inner peace. And so what we want is more water versus less soda. So what I found is it's helpful to replace shoulds with it may benefit me too, right? It may enhance my life too, but I'm already enough even if I don't go to the gym, you know? Yeah, that, that's, that's great. And so for somebody that's working on their own and something that's very interesting to me and the, the type of people that we support here at We Do is freelancers, independent contractors, people that do their own thing are not part of that corporate umbrella. Um, so I've taken a step myself out of the corporate world and, and gone out on my own a few times in various different directions. You've done that yourself. It's pretty intimidating to do that, especially if you have a predictable salary, paid vacation time, health benefits, and all of those benefits of being employed by a corporation. And the thought of giving them up and jumping out and doing something on your own, that's pretty scary. Um, you've made it work for you. So if somebody were to come to you and, and say, look, I really want to go out on my own. I've, I've got this benefit of the salary and everything, but I know I can do better, but I'm scared of doing it. I, I don't know how to do it. What type of advice would you give them? So, you know, if you have a job, I and mean, this is what I did, you know, I had a full-time job and I hustled and cultivated and built up my private practice while working a 40, 50 hour work week. And I, that was a stretch, but if, I, if no one showed up for my private practice that week, my bills were covered. You know, I, my needs were met. I was not grasping from a place of a held breath drowning. I was, I was safe. And so, you know, I would say if you have the opportunity, you know, and you're working in a place, you know, it's easy to feel defeated when we work a job that we don't feel aligned is aligned for us. 
So when you work a full-time job and are also building your private practice, that's really hard, but it creates it so that you can enjoy the private practice without scrambling and, you know, grasping for enough sessions to pay your bills. So yeah. Yeah. that would be my, my two cents. And what you've just described is what's kind of commonly known as the side gig or the side hustle, um, which many people are doing and, and actually have had more of an opportunity to do with the pandemic and working at home and, um, and being able to spend less time commuting maybe and, and more time being able to do the things that they want to do and guiding them into that. And maybe this is why we're seeing so many people resign from traditional jobs. And I, I, I think, again, this is something we could probably debate for hours, but the world of work is changing and, and it will be evolving for a long time. So Robbie, a couple of things before we wrap up here, a couple of quick questions. Uh, first is, who are your role models? Is there anybody dead or alive history or currently that inspires you that re you really get a lot of energy from? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the old guru that, I, that I, I've read a lot of the teachings of was Ma uh, Swami Master Shivananda was the, the guru that uh, I was, I'd learned the teachings of as a kid. Um, there was a cool uh, speech with Matthew McConaughey, though, where he's like, the, my hero is me in 10 years time. And I, I really like that notion, though, where you really visualize where you want to get to. And, you know, then, then it's just about closing the gap with micro objectives and tinkering with the picture, to, you know, to close that gap, you know. But I, I love that if you see yourself in the future as someone you can look up to, it can make it easier to show up to create that. Yeah. I'll tell you another thing that somebody said to me once, um, which I think is, is, is a great way of looking at it, is if you could write yourself a letter to yourself when you were, say, 15 years old, what would you be telling yourself? And you know, with the benefit of this is where I am today, who would have thought when I was a mere teenager that I would have been able to achieve what I've done? And for many of us, it, it's things that we never could have envisioned for ourselves. Yeah, it's interesting because what goes with that also is, you know, if we're always f staying focused on forward motion and productivity and development, sometimes we can overlook the gratitude of being currently where we used to dream we would hopefully get to. You know what I mean? Like some days I struggle with clients with no shows and dealing with paperwork and there's a lot of headache to private practice. And it's easy to forget that, you know, when I used to work a nine to five, I would dream of, of being my own boss. And so I think it's, it's a yes and, you know, allow yourself to keep grasping, but also appreciate where you've, where you've gotten to already, you know? Yeah. So Robbie, if anybody wants to reach you, um, what we've, we posted down in the uh, narrative below is uh, your contact information, your email. Uh, there's a link through Psychology Today where people can reach you. And um, mm -hmm. I would say anybody that uh, could use Robbie to help them out, um, go ahead and get in touch. I hope that's okay with you. Absolutely. Appreciate Good. that. Good. So what does the future hold for you? Oh, man. Uh, keep playing my guitar. Keep writing poems. Um, keep working on uh, whittling it down. I think that like anyone else, it's easy to... Uh, yeah, find ourselves what we call future tripping to keep whittling myself back to what's right in front of me yeah and uh allowing that unknown to come i think part of the fun is is you know the unknown scary but it's also kind of exciting right it can be kind of an adventure too to not know what comes around the bend yeah great robbie you've talked us a lot about finding your inner energy here um may you continue to do that for a long time may you help many people and thank you so much for being here and every success in continuing your good work. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was wonderful. Great. And thank you everybody for watching and listening here. If you enjoyed this video, please leave your comments below and subscribe to our channel and see you next time. We upload a We Do Talk every week. So if you enjoyed this one, please subscribe and leave your comments below.